Welcome again, this is a short recording on the carbon cycle and energy insecurity just before your A-level exams looking at knowledge gaps. So the contents of this session will be on ocean sequestration, the three different types of pumps within the ocean, thermohaline circulation and how that works as a conveyor belt around the world. We'll look at the carbon case study of the Amazon rainforest briefly, and we're also going to look at the UK, France and the USA as an energy consumption mix difference. So let's get started straight away. There are three different pumps in ocean sequestration. Now remember, ocean sequestration simply means the transfer and storage of carbon. That's all it is. It's the movement and the storage of it. There is the first pump we're going to look at is the biological pump. Now the biological pump transfers carbon from the ocean surface, so the top layer of the ocean, into marine plants like phytoplankton through photosynthesis. So that idea of solar energy hitting down on the Earth's surface, and of course we know that light only goes th through the Earth's um, ocean surface, that transfers into phytoplankton, which are oceanic plants, through photosynthesis. So that creates carbon dioxide. That converts carbon dioxide into food then in those phytoplankton for zooplankton. So zooplankton eat phytoplankton and those zooplankton then capture that energy and they store in themselves the carbon. The carbon is then recycled near the surface, so it remains in the surface of the ocean, but 30% of it sinks into the deep waters of the ocean and is converted back into standard gas when the zooplankton die of carbon dioxide. So it's released from the dead body of the zooplankton and that eventually, as you can see on the diagram, sinks down into the rock through sedimentation, the compression of the carbon dioxide creating rock. So very simply, this is about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the ocean transferring into phytoplankton plants, then eaten by zooplankton, they die, that transfers into 30% of it sinking into deep waters, some of it remains at the top, and that transfers into ocean rock. So. The reason it's called the biological pump is because it's about biology, it's about plant life and animal life moving the carbon from the ocean and the atmosphere to rock. The second one is the physical pump. Now the best way to remember this one is that it's physical, it actually involves movement. It's something that physically moves. It's the water moving the carbon. So we have downwelling and upwelling in an ocean. And that is when water shifts downwards due to currents and upwards due to currents. Downwelling happens where there is cold, dense water. So a lot like air, cold air sinks. Cold water also sinks. Downwelling, therefore, brings carbon dioxide into the deep ocean. It sinks it downward. We're not talking here about phytoplankton or zooplankton. This is simply the water itself. Once the carbon is in the deep ocean, it remains there for a long time. Eventually though, due to thermohaline circulation, different warm and cold ocean currents moving, the carbon comes back up to the ocean surface. It upwells to the ocean surface. This is all because of the movement of the ocean. And some of that carbon at the surface then, as you can see on the diagram, goes into atmospheric carbon, is released into the atmosphere through evaporation. So the key thing with the physical pump is that it involves the physical movement, upwelling and downwelling of water. Cold water stores more carbon and therefore cold downwelling moves most carbon downward. Thermohaline circulation can move it back upward to the ocean surface and back to the atmosphere. And finally, we have the idea of the carbonate pump. Now, the best way to remember this one is carbonate rock and carbonate dead organisms. So this is the eventual storage of carbon dioxide into sedimented rock. 
So this is basically where carbon is transferred into sedimented rock by organisms. Dead organisms like phytoplankton, zooplankton, corals, shells fall to the ocean floor. They contain carbon dioxide. They compress over time. They're rich in calcium carbonate. They form limestone, rock over time, and that transfers that carbon into that rock. So that's a deep ocean, long-term storage of carbonate. They're the three pumps. It's as simple as that. You've just got to come up with key things to remember for each one. And they all create a dynamic equilibrium. They all create a balance in carbon in the oceans we have. I mentioned thermohaline circulation. So just to go through that briefly as well. This is often referred to as the Earth's or the ocean's giant conveyor belt. And you can see it on the right hand side there. Remember we said that cooler water stores more carbon and warmer surface water stores less. But of course we have upwelling and downwelling as a result of thermohaline circulation. So this is what is transferring all of that carbon in the physical pump. It is a global system of these ocean currents and it's driven by temperature and it's also driven by salinity, which is salt levels in the water. And this is like trade winds. It's the average movement of the water due to its temperature and the level of salt within it. It's really important, this, for regulating carbon in our oceans and how much you find at the surface and in the deep ocean. Colder water stores more carbon than warmer water. We already said that. And the, the role of thermohaline circulation is not only just to store carbon where it needs to be and create a dynamic equilibrium. It's also to regulate the amount of carbon dioxide, the pH and the temperature of our oceans. Okay, so this is more EQ2 now of carbon and it's looking at the main case studies for energy. Now, the specification asks you to look at the UK, sorry, the USA and France, but I also look at the UK for this one as a good comparison for 12 mark questions. So on the left here, as you can see, we've got the USA. Now the USA has a rather diverse energy mix but it does rely heavily on non-renewables, oil, gas, and coal. They make up 80% roughly of all of France and the USA's energy mix. So in comparison on the right, France is heavily invested in nuclear energy. And that is why these two make a good comparison. As you can see, in terms of France, we have a 71% nuclear energy rate in 2017. We then have 10% hydro, 7% gas, 2% coal, and so on. So these stats on screen, I would say, are very useful for your notes. You do need stats in a case study question like this to be able to compare. If you don't spend the time learning some of these stats, you may as well not answer the question. So do spend time looking at the stats for the USA and France. But I'm just going to give you a roundup now of some of the stats to be aware of. The USA is the second in the world for energy consumption itself. That's because of its population and industry mainly. It has a population of 310 million people. Three quarters of the energy in France comes from, sorry, in the USA comes from fossil fuels, as you've seen earlier, nearly 80%. The key thing about the USA is it's very self-sufficient in energy. It's very energy secure. And the reason for that is because, we'll go back to the diagrams, it has a varying mix. So it does not rely heavily on one type of energy source. And also, it can source oil, gas and coal from its own landscape and surrounding oceans. So it does have a secure, reliable supply of energy as a result. It is not the best energy consumption mix for climate change or for sustainability. However, it is secure. 
Now if we jump to France, France is 10th in the world for its energy consumption with a population of 65 million. So it is a smaller nation and therefore it has less energy consumption. 25% of France's energy comes from fossil fuels and 70% comes from nuclear power. Now that's nearly in direct opposite in a way to the USA where 75% of its fossil fuels, of its energy comes from fossil fuels. So it's a very different energy mix we're looking at here and a very different energy consumption. Half of all of France's primary energy is imported and that is less energy secure. Therefore, what we're saying here is half of its oil and gas and so on is imported. It is not on the landscape or in the sea surrounding it itself. And therefore, it relies on other nations to sell it those products, those primary energy sources. That makes it less secure in its energy compared to, for example, the USA. We could also say with France, finally, that because 70% of its energy comes from nuclear sources, so it's relying on uranium mainly, that there could be a slight issue if there are decreasing uranium supplies in future. And therefore, we might have a problem with its energy, energy security in future as well. So despite France relying less heavily on non-renewable fossil fuels, and therefore it is more sustainable for the climate, actually... France is less secure overall because it relies on others for its energy security. And finally, I like to throw in the UK here as a good comparison to these two as well. The UK really does have a varied energy mix, a lot like the USA. However, the USA's energy mix relies more heavily on fossil fuels than does the UK. So the UK is the better of those two. The UK has had a complete shift away from primary energy consumption like coal and it has moved directly to alternatives like renewables and nuclear power. But as you can see, it's different to France because we have a very equal energy mix and energy consumption. So 20% from nuclear, 25% from renewables, 30% from gas, 20% from coal. Only 0.6% from oil. We have phased that out quite a bit. And coal has fallen dramatically as well. So we have a very varied energy mix in the UK. And it is a really good comparison, therefore, to make between that, the USA, and France. Finally, in carbon, we're looking here at the Amazon rainforest as a case study. Now, this is a very small case study. It's more of an example of how important carbon is and how it plays a role in rainforests. So just to give you some context, in the Amazon rainforest, 40% of South America's landmass and 300 billion trees exist there. So this is a very significant part of the world in terms of landscape size. It is the largest carbon sink in the world. It's the lar largest transfer, of s transfer and storage of carbon in the world terrestrially on land. So it's very, very important, therefore, in terms of the carbon cycle. CO2 provides productivity to it. So carbon actually provides the tools the soil needs to grow trees and higher photosynthesis rates and therefore the reproduction of plants. So it is an extremely important example of carbon and its role on land. However, human activity such as deforestation threatens the Amazon rainforest. Without trees, the soil suffers runoff, surface runoff of water, and it loses its humus layer. It loses the ability to grow more trees. CO2 from those trees that did exist and from the soil transfers into the hydrosphere, which is the atmosphere. Soil, therefore, can't support new tree growth and it increases the atmospheric CO2 levels overall because it's constantly feeding back into the atmosphere rather than the soil using the CO2 to grow trees. That has consequences for climate change, of course. So the link, therefore, between carbon and climate change is very simply that carbon plays a massive role in the Amazon rainforest. Deforestation is threatening that role and climate change will increase as a result. 
There have been attempts to manage that though in the Amazon specifically with the ideas of selective logging laws, replanting and afforestation, environmental laws in Brazil and internationally such as Paris 2015, COP26 and giving areas protected status such as national parks. However, we need to be very careful because even with all this management in place, the Amazon rainforest is still depleting in stocks of trees and therefore carbon sink totals and it could be a great threat in future. So that is everything we need to go through for the carbon cycle and energy security. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much.